So in today's video, we're going to be going over Newton's laws of motion, all three of them. In fact, before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, support my channel step by step science, get all my excellent physics, chemistry and math videos. You can like, you can share, you can comment and you can give me a thumbs up for this video also, please. And don't forget, I've made some previous videos for Newton's Law, which you can link to in the upper right-hand corner of this video. But this is Newton's Laws of Motion, and there are three laws of motion, as you know, and they are simply referred to as the first law, the second law, and the third law. Newton's first law of motion says that objects in motion stay in motion. And we say objects in motion stay in motion. We mean that they're going to keep moving with the same speed in the same direction. So objects in motion stay in motion and objects at rest stay at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. All right, we say unbalanced force because it is unbalanced forces that cause objects to accelerate. If you're accelerating, you're experiencing unbalanced forces. But Newton's law, first law, really deals with constant velocity. And when we have constant velocity, we have balanced forces. So sometimes you'll hear people refer to it as the law of balanced forces or it deals with balanced forces. Also, sometimes you'll hear people refer to it as the law of inertia. Inertia is an object's resistance or a measure of an object's resistance to a change in motion. Inertia, we say, is a property of matter. Okay, inertia is not a force. It's not an acceleration or something else. It's just an object's resistance to a measure, as to a change in motion. Now, it's a little confusing sometimes because you really can't quantify inertia. You can't say something has so many units of inertia. Okay, it's just something that is related to an object's mass. So inertia officially is a measure of an object's resistance to change in motion or a change in velocity. Well, what kind of objects resist or have a high resistance to a change in velocity? Well, those are objects that are more massive. The more massive an object is, not necessarily the bigger it is, but the more mass that it has, it's harder to change its motion. All right, and so really we can equate, or there's a direct relationship between mass and inertia. Now mass, we can quantify. You can say something has a mass of so many kilograms or so many grams, but you cannot really quantify inertia. But we say that more mass means more inertia. For example, if we have a bicycle that has some mass, but if we have a train, that's gonna have more mass. So which of those objects has more inertia? Well, obviously the train has more mass, so it has more inertia than the bicycle. The bicycle has less mass and therefore it has less inertia. If you think about a train moving with a certain velocity and a bicycle moving with the same velocity, which of those two things would be harder to stop or which one would have, would it be harder to change its motion? Well, that would be the train because the train has more mass and therefore it has more inertia. All right, now, we like to say that the Newton's first law deals when deals with situations where the forces are balanced, because that's when we have objects in motion stay in motion, or objects at rest stay at rest. And when your forces are balanced, then the net force, there's not an unbalanced force. The forces are balanced, the net force is equal to zero Newtons. And if your forces are balanced, and the net force is equal to zero Newtons, then there's no acceleration. And that means you're going to be moving with a constant velocity. So all three of those things kind of go together, or all four of those things. Forces are balanced, net force zero, no acceleration, and constant velocity. And if your velocity is constant, then you can really be doing one of two things. All right, there's two ways to have zero acceleration and constant velocity. And one of the ways is if you're at rest, and an object at rest has a velocity of zero. You're just standing still. You're not moving. Or you can be an object in motion, but moving with a constant velocity. Your speed and your direction are not changing. And in both cases, if your forces are balanced, you're going to continue doing the same thing. So if the forces are balanced and you're an object at rest, then you're going to remain at rest. You're going to stay at rest. If you're moving with a certain velocity in a certain direction or speed in a certain direction, then you're going to maintain. You're going to stay with the same motion, which means you're going to continue moving with the same speed and in the same 
direction. Okay? And that is Newton's first law, the law of balanced forces, the law of inertia. Okay, now we have Newton's second law. Newton's second law is often referred to just as F equals MA. The force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. All right, F equals MA. And sometimes you'll hear people say, well, in order to accelerate a mass, you need a force. All right, now when we're accelerating a mass, we're changing its motion. That means we're going to have unbalanced forces. So you can kind of refer to Newton's second law as the law of unbalanced forces. Now, oftentimes when we have, not oftentimes, but oftentimes when we're, well, oftentimes when we're talking about Newton's second law, we want to calculate the acceleration. So it's interesting to think about what is the relationship between the acceleration, the mass, and the force. Okay, so please don't forget when the forces are unbalanced, then the net force is not equal to zero and that you are going to be accelerating. Either your direction or your speed is going to be changing. That is acceleration. But when you're accelerating, we're going to be using Newton's second law, F equals MA, to calculate your acceleration. So we're going to take this equation and rearrange it to solve for the acceleration. And then we can talk about what's the relationship between the force applied to an object and its acceleration, and what's the relationship between the mass of an object and its acceleration. And you should remember, and you should notice from this equation, because we have a fraction over here, and the force is on the numerator on the top of this fraction, the mass is on the bottom in the denominator of that fraction. That means for the force, that the acceleration of the object is directly proportional to the net force. This force right here is really the net force, the sum of all the forces that are acting on an object. And you can see when you have the F on the top, the force on the top half of this fraction, if we increase the force on the object, then we're going to increase the acceleration. If we decrease the force, then we're going to get a lower acceleration. Now, for the mass, Okay, the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. Now, the mass is down here in the denominator. If we divide by a bigger number, we're going to get a lower acceleration. But that should also make common sense. The higher the mass, the larger the mass, the harder it is going to be to accelerate the object. So that's like we said with the train and the bicycle. The train has a much higher mass. It's harder to get the train moving Okay, you have to apply a greater force to accelerate that than you wouldn't have a bicycle. You just get on your bicycle and start going. Okay, a train, you need much more of higher force to get that train to be accelerating. So once again, the force is directly proportional to the acceleration, or the acceleration is directly proportional to the force. And that means when we increase the force, we increase the acceleration. See, they both go up directly proportional. If we decrease the force, then we're going to be decreasing the acceleration. And for the mass, the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. That means if we increase the mass of an object and keep the force the same, then we're going to have a lower acceleration. If we decrease the mass, then we're going to have a greater acceleration. You can see here the arrows point in the same direction. One goes up, the other goes up. That's directly proportional. Inversely, is one goes up and the other goes down, or one goes down and the other goes up. Okay? So... That is Newton's second law. Now, of course, we have Newton's third law. And the third law is simply just stated as for most common people to say for every action, there is an opposite but equal reaction. And an example that's kind of often given is you have a person, you have like a wall here, or an object here, and you attach a rope to the, between those two, and the person pulls, with, let's say, a force of 40 Newtons, then we say, oh, the wall pulls back with a force of 40 newtons. And those two forces are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that because we want to be able to talk about the forces and draw these vectors, which are the action-reaction force pairs. So I gave, I found this picture. Here's the guy in the green shirt, the green guy. Here's the guy in the gray shirt, the gray guy. And most likely, because this guy's using his arms, the, gray, the green guy is pushing on the gray guy. Well, when the green guy pushes on the gray guy, the gray guy, even though he's not pushing with his arms or his hands or his legs, his body pushes back. So this arrow represents the force on this guy from this guy. 
and this arrow at the same time represents the force on the green guy from the gray guy. And these two force arrows are the equal but opposite reaction forces. And we call those equal but actual opposite reaction forces as the action-reaction force pairs. And you need to be able to draw the action-reaction force pairs for any particular situation. Okay? Now, a little background on those force pairs is the force pairs always come in pairs. That's why they're called action-reaction force pairs. And as we said, they're equal in magnitude, okay, in the opposite reaction force pairs, okay? So they're equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Now, something else you should remember is they act on two different objects, so when we draw them, we're going to be drawing them on two different objects. They don't appear on the same object. Because one object is pushing on one, and one object is pushing on the other. Okay? And we have two different. I'm going to go over a couple examples. And please remember, they are equal in magnitude, again, but opposite in direction. Now, on this next slide, I'm going to show you how first not to draw them, and then I'm going to show you how to draw them, okay? So here we have a bottle on a table, and you might say, okay, draw the force, uh, the action-reaction force pairs for the bottle and the table, because the bottle is pushing on the table, and the table is pushing on the bottle, and you might think, okay, I'm going to draw the free body diagram for the bottle, because I know the free body diagram for the bottle, we've drawn that before, we have the force of gravity pulls down, and the normal force from the table pushes up, and you might say, okay, that's the action-reaction pairs. Well, that breaks one of the rules for the action-reaction pairs because they cannot be on the same object. You can't draw them. This is just, this is actually the free body diagram for the object, but the free body diagram and the action-reaction pairs are not the same thing. You're not drawing the free body diagram, you're drawing the action-reaction force pairs. So this is not right. So we want to draw now the action-reaction force pairs for the bottle and the table. Now, it doesn't matter which one you start with, but you can see that the bottle is pushing down on the table, and then the table is pushing up on the bottle. And you see they're drawn on two different objects. We have two objects. Each one gets its own force from the force-reaction force pairs. And you can see I labeled them like this. This is the common way to do it. You put F for force and it's the force on the table from the bottle. And you could switch them from the bottle on the table, but I like to do the force on the table from the bottle. Now, the opposite but equal reaction is the force on the bottle from the table. You can see if you draw this one as force table bottle, then it's the opposite is force bottle table. All I did was switch those two descriptors, those two letters. But I drew the vectors so they're the same length because they're equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Okay, so let's try a couple others. Here we have a safe sitting on the ground, and we want to draw the action-reaction pairs for the safe and the ground. So we know that the safe is pushing on the ground. So this is the force on the ground from the safe. Well, now we have to have the force on the safe from the ground. Now, that I just put SG. Now, you might say, well, the, the force is right here and the force is right here. You could draw them a little closer, but you want to make sure you draw them on separate objects. And really, it doesn't matter where. Really, you should just have this one be on the safe somewhere. I think that would be okay. Okay, next one. We have the force reaction pairs for the helicopter and the bird, which are going to collide into each other. So you could actually kind of... Uh, you know, stop the video right now if you wanted to for a moment and just draw the force pairs and label them correctly. Try that. Okay, so now let's try this. We have when these two things collide, okay, first of all, or not first of all, but at the same time, there is going to be a force on the helicopter from the bird. All right, and then there's going to be a force on the bird from the helicopter, unfortunately. Okay, now that might not end up very well for either the helicopter or the bird, but that's how you would draw it, like that. HBBH. Now we can do the next one. We have a shark swimming in the ocean. Let's just say it's moving its tail back and forth to swim, and therefore we have the force on the tail from the water. Okay, the water is applying a force to the tail. Well, when that happens, 
then the, uh, the, there's a force on the water from the tail of the shark. T is for tail, W for water. Like that, you see they're on opposite objects. Here, one is the object is the tail. Here, the other object is the water, the water molecules, like that. Okay, now I think we have maybe one more. Here we have a person running, a boy running. And when the boy runs, he has his foot here, and he's going to be pushing on the ground. So we have the force on the ground from the child. They put C for child, ground, child. Then when it happens, what happens, the opposite force is on the force from the ground on the child. So this is the force on the child from the ground. The ground's pushing back. You push one way, the ground pushes back, like when you push on the wall, but you're pushing with your foot when you're running. Okay? So that is Newton's three laws of motion. First law, balance forces. Second law, well, let's say first law, constant velocity, balance force. Second law, acceleration, unbalanced forces. And third law, action, reaction, force pairs. Okay, there you go. Hope you found that video helpful. If you did, please do all the following four things. You should, please, and once again, subscribe to my channel, get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. You could give me a thumbs up for this video. You could leave me a nice positive comment in the comment section below. And then, of course, don't forget to share this video with all of your friends. Sharing is caring. Show them just how much you care. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you in the next video.